Giselle by Reginald Otley. Chapter 1 Giselle whirled around. Before her, in the dense guava scrub, a deer leaped upright. Its tall, velvety horns seemed to quiver for a moment. Then the animal plunged away. Within seconds it was gone, merged soundlessly with the bush-covered headland. Even the sea spread hazily on the shoreline, seemed hushed to a greater silence after the startled deer's passing. Poised rigidly, Giselle felt unreal, as if the deer had been a ghost or a fleeting gossamer, shape wafted from nowhere into nothing before her own startled gaze, yet she remembered the terror stark in the limpid eyes. Their wide, frantic urgency made her feel suddenly sad. She wished that the sleek, graceful body could have paused long enough for her to soothe or stroke a hand on the tense, quivering head. Then she began to pull more guava fruit from the trees. It is silly, she whispered, to have such thoughts, but deer are gentle, very gentle. When the sack she carried was full, she, sh she slung it over her shoulder. The firm apple-sized <clears throat> guavas made a heavy load, but she carried them carefully. They were for making the jam her uncle loved. He had asked her early that morning to gather some fruit for him. Struggling clear of the scrub, Giselle came into the fierce, bright sunlight. Its heat stung her face while she shifted the sack to an easier drag on her shoulder. Trudging on, she remembered the deer and its sudden startled plunging. The wild agony of fear that had flooded through its eyes. <clears throat> there seemed no place in the now quiet, hushed scene for dread or pain, yet her keen eyes had seen a scar on the deer's sleek rump, even as the animal was vanishing. Some hunter has aimed for its heart and missed, she thought as she hurried on toward the beach. The good god was watching in time to move the rifle. Belief was strong in Giselle. The thought made her wonder why some should be spared and others fall, while others lived on scarred and wounded. Like uncle, she thought, bent over under her load with his poor twisted body. The big illness warped him until his limbs grew stiff. Now he is locked in hunched-backed shame. She could imagine him as the beach drew nearer in the way she liked to remember, tall and strong, with big teeth that shone whitely when he tossed her up on his shoulder. That shoulder had seemed as wide as a door to her small, trusting body. It was said in the village those few short years ago that Pierre Marcel, her uncle, was a man to be envied. His looks and strength were those of a giant who strode carelessly over the mountains or swam hugely in the sea of the island. Then suddenly, overnight, he had wakened to a stiffness. His body had burned with a fever that had left him shrunken and weak after its passing. The following years worsened the twist of his stiffened limbs. Reaching the beach, Giselle stood the, sta the sack under a leaning tree. Its straggly bows gave enough broken shade to protect the guavas while she cooled her feet in the sea. Afterward, with the fine white sand,
powdering through her toes, she decided to search for crabs. The tide was ebbing, and many should be leaving the nearby mangrove swamps. It is full moon, she thought, and they will be fat. Maman will be glad of them for the table. Amongst the ribby, oyster-covered mangrove roots, the sand changed to mud, a thick, oozy blackness that squelched noisily when she tried to creep. The first crab she saw scuttled into a receding channel of water, and she splashed excitedly after it. With the short forked stick she had snapped from a bush, she made several thrusts at the crab until at last she turned it over. Then, with practiced hands that avoided the big, groping claws by a fraction, she carried the crab to where she could tie it with bark strips torn from the mangroves. Searching again, she caught, in all, five big bluish crabs before at last the tide had drained from the mangroves. Tired but happy, she strung the crabs together and returned to the guavas. After checking the crabs to see that their claws were secure, she swung the sack of guavas onto her other shoulder. Bent over again, she trudged on toward a narrow track, winding haphazardly across the headland. When she reached it and paused for a moment to regain her breath, she peered around anxiously. The thought worrying her was that she was trespassing. The land was owned by a cattle company and managed by an Australian. If he should come, Giselle thought, trudging on, or one of his stockmen, there will be trouble. It is the law not to trespass or steal, and I have been stealing though the guavas grow wild in the bush. She consoled herself with the thought th that the guavas did not matter. They were a pest everyone tried to destroy because of the smothering damage they did. Each year, more acres of land were made useless by their thick, tangling growth, and the fruit was the seed that spread the plants. Each one in the sack, Giselle thought, has many seeds that will not ripen. To pluck them, I am indeed doing good. The crabs did not worry her. They were taken from the sea, and no man could own the sea, or could he? She went on thoughtfully, hoping that no man could. It was the first time such a thought had occurred to her, and she decided to ask her uncle. Her father she seldom saw because he worked in the nickel mines. Her mother was a woman who spoke little. She was always troubled by the listless heat that beaded her sallow face with sweat. Unlike Giselle, she seldom emerged from the small white stone cottage where the family lived, reaching a dark, forbidding gorge where the track meandered under huge matted trees, Giselle paused again to rest. The sack was heavy, and its knobbly contents hurt her shoulders. The crabs, too, seemed to grow heavier in her hand. Perhaps, she whispered, peering ahead, I should not have come this way. It would have been better to return by the road I came. It was a familiar road, the one she had traveled that morning, and a cool one, scampering along on the sea's sparkling edge. The idea of returning by her present route had come while she was picking the guavas. Many times she had overheard the men talking of this track, the men who used their flashlights for the illegal hunting of deer. At night, she shivered as she imagined them creeping where she now stood, with their rifles out thrust the long silver beams of light, probing from their flashlights. Yet this way was shorter by at least a kilometer if she could follow it. Hunched under her load again, she trudged into the eerie twilight, 
beneath the trees. The coolness after the fierce sun heat made an icy film on her skin. She could feel the coldness wrapping around her as she walked. Then a shrill, mournful bellow echoed distantly in the gorge. It brought an added chill. That must be the wild batel, she whispered, the wild cattle I have heard of. Cold with fear, she hurried on. Thoughts of the stories her uncle had told her came vividly to mind. Stories of wild, reckless men and huge, long-horned cattle crashing through the scrub. Men gored and bloody, horned from their horses, cattle defying all the skill of stockmen and living wraith-like in the dense scrub growth, Neuli, Guava, Lantana, and Thorny, Twisted, Cassis. Another mournful bellow sounded, coming nearer and nearer, almost running. Giselle staggered each time the sack on her shoulder bumped or slithered, or the crabs bounced on her legs. Uppermost in her mind was to get clear of the gorge. Her uncle had said the cattle stayed hidden during daylight. Only at night did they venture onto the plains and clearings to graze. The surrounding matted jungle was their haven. Oh, la la, Giselle whispered, gasping for breath. I am truly frightened. She began to run, despite her load. She was close to complete exhaustion when she stumbled clear of the jungle and sprawled headlong in a grassy hollow. Staring up at the high, cloud-flecked sky, she gulped in the air that hurt her lungs. At last, she sat up to stare around dazedly. The crabs and the sack lay nearby. One of the crabs had freed its claws and was trying to escape, dragging the other four after it. Retying the claws gave Giselle time to steady her trembling hands. Then she scrambled upright and once more followed the winding track. An hour or more later, the barbed wire boundary fence of the cattle property came into view and Giselle descended from a scrub-covered ridge. Breathless and limping from a cassis thorn that had pierced her bare foot, she sighed thankfully, glad to see the dusty road stretching beyond the fence. Sight of it reminded her again she was trespassing. I must be careful, she thought, to get through the wires unseen. It is fortunate the road stretches long and straight just here. I can see any cars or trucks before their drivers see me. The thought gave her a sense of confidence, but she knew she had to be careful. Even Monsieur la Gendarme might happen to pass by in his jeep. The road remained empty until Giselle reached the fence. She decided to crawl under where tall grass grew on each side, and she was reasonably hidden while she crouched on all fours. First, she pushed the guavas and crabs under the bottom wire. Then she saw a huge truck coming. When it roared close in a cloud of swirling dust, she knew it as a truck owned and driven by Paul Lagarde, a friend of her father's. Waving her arms, she tried to attract the driver's attention, but he sped past unseeing. His gaze saw only the road ahead, and Giselle shrugged disconsolately. So, she said, he did not see me. Now I must walk all the way unless another comes. She had no fear of any truck driver know <clears throat> knowing she was or had been trespassing. They were men who trespassed on others' properties at every opportunity. The two men she had to evade were the Australian manager and 
Monsieur la gendarme. Climbing carefully between the barbed wires, Giselle gathered up the sack and crabs and carried them onto the road. Its hard, gravelly surface hurt her feet more than the bush track, yet there was the knowledge that she was nearly home another half kilometer. The store of Madame Duval would show, and beyond the small clustered village. She could imagine as she walked the aroma of food being cooked on wood fire stoves. Her mother had said there were surf steaks fried in seasoned oil for the meal today. This reminder of deer meat conjured up another memory for Giselle of the deer she had seen earlier. I eat the meat, she thought, yet show sorrow for the deer. Their gentle grace means little once a hunter has skinned and quartered their bodies. Giselle was practical. Beyond the sensitive emotions that disturbed her was the reality of living. She knew that on the sea-locked island of New Caledonia, food was expensive. Whatever could be gathered from the natural harvest of meats, fish, and fruits had to be gathered. Deep within her were the roots of peasant ancestors, people who had worked the harsh, unyielding southern lands of France before coming to New Caledonia. Giselle pushed the long hair from her face with the wrist of her crab-filled hand. The dangling weight filled her with a sudden exultation. Five crabs, she thought, and guavas for uncle. It has indeed been a morning to remember. The good God was kind to smile so freely on my efforts. Another hundred meters or more brought her to the cattle company's limits. On both sides of the road, big corner posts stood, carrying signs to that effect. From the post on the left-hand side, an angling line of barbed wire fence scarred its way right up to a range of towering mountain peaks. To the right, a similar fence cleaved through scrub and rolling grasslands until it reached the coast and the blue of the mighty Pacific. Giselle was well past the boundary corner post when she heard a car approaching from behind. Sighing her relief, she turned as tires scrunched, and a voice said, Bonjour, mademoiselle, comment ça va? The voice was kind, yet had a tone of authority that made Giselle lower her glance. She dug at the dusty road with one big toe, while she said softly, Bonjour, monsieur. I am well, thank you, and you, monsieur. All is well with you. The man in the car was the Australian manager. He was a quiet, sunburned man who seldom smiled. There was an air of loneliness about him that Giselle liked. He stepped from his car and opened a real rear door, thoughtfully as he said, I am well, thank you, though it seems all is not well with you. That is a heavy load you are carrying, and I noticed you limping. While he spoke, he was remembering the country that stretched outside the boundary as far as the sea. No casses grew there nor was there any guava scrub. The nearest guavas, other than those on the cattle company's property, were the other way, some distance beyond the village. You are tired, he added, and the road empty of trucks. Their drivers have gone for their midday meal. Give me the sack, and you can ride as far as your uncle's. I am going there to buy maize. With quick, Sure movements, he dumped the guavas on the back seat, then strode around the front bumper to open a front door for Giselle. Voila, he added, and lifted the last crab in after her. Now we shall soon be at your uncle's. Once moving, the big car gathered speed, and soon Giselle saw Madame Duval's store, as the car sped past, she saw a scatter of chickens flee, squawking from the wheels, and a group of men staring from the store's veranda. Then the car raced around a bend into the tiny village, 
and on to her uncle's small farm. Within minutes, Giselle was scrambling from the car, dragging the tethered crabs. In front of her were the ramshackle steps leading up into her uncle's house. The Australian's hand touching her shoulder reminded her of the guavas. Turning quickly, she said, Thank you, monsieur. I am forgetting. Will you put them here by the steps, if you please? She gestured awkwardly, suddenly feeling ill at ease. Madame Marie Therese, who kept house for her uncle, was standing black draped and silent, watching from a window in the house. There was a feeling of mystery about Marie Therese that Giselle could never pierce. Her uncle would never talk of her, neither would Giselle's mother. Villagers stood in silence when Marie Therese passed by, and when she was gone, talked of other things. For people who habitually gossiped, this was indeed strange. Dumping the guavas where Giselle had pointed, the Australian said, Will you tell your uncle I am here, mademoiselle? Tell him, too, I shall not stay long. Giselle said, We, oui, and leaving the crabs in some shade, ran up the steps. When she reappeared later, she beckoned the Australian. He followed her through two barley, barely furnished rooms to a long, boarded in veranda, where a man lay on a huge, old fashioned French bedstead, overhung by a crumbling, cobwebby canopy. The man was Pierre Marcel, Giselle's uncle. Raising one thin, twisted hand, he said, Bonjour, monsieur. Thank you for giving Giselle a lift. It is for me she gathered guavas. For a moment, the Australian stood looking down. The warped, humped body lying grotesquely on the bed seemed unreal after the great, unclouded blueness outside, and he felt a great sadness. Then he said, Bonjour, it is a pleasure I would do for you and for her many times. Yet, I tell you this. My friend, she must be careful of the cattle. It is not only the wild cattle that can do damage. The cattle we breed for beef are not very docile. Men can be horned, never mind a young girl. The knowledge that the Australian manager had known she had been trespassing made Giselle gasp. Staring wide-eyed, she walked around the bed and suddenly said, Au revoir, monsieur, and you, my uncle. Then she left, hurrying quickly again through the bare, dusty rooms. On her way home, Giselle thought about her uncle, his housekeeper, and the Australian manager. She wondered what he would say the next time he saw her, or if he would even speak. He is a strange one, she told her mother when she reached home. He said little to me in the car, yet he warned Uncle Pierre that I should not trespass. That is good, is it not, Mama? Giselle's mother smiled. Yes, my little one, she said. It is good. He is kind to have helped you, even though he knew you had been trespassing. Yet they say he is hard to men who hunt or are cruel to animals. His stockmen say he makes them wash their horses after they have been ridden. Thought of the rough, swaggering stockmen she knew being made to wash their horses seemed incomprehensible to Giselle. Watching her mother serve the midday meal, it was accepted that they were careless with their animals. Giselle said, Of that I am glad, if a man is gentle, it does not say that he is weak. Her fair hair fell over her face, and she brushed it away. Impatiently, she sat down opposite her mother. They were quiet then, while they ate the meal. Outside, in the hot island sunshine, a rooster squawked, as if it were choking. The heat was oppressive in the small, whitewashed kitchen. Hooked on a nail in the wall, the five crabs dangled listlessly. They would be boiled in salted water for the evening meal. Chapter 2 
For several days, Giselle avoided her uncle's house. It was late one afternoon when she finally went up the steps. As usual, her uncle was lying sprawled stiffly on the bed. She kissed him, then sat holding one of his hands while he talked. The sunlight was reaching in through the shutters with long golden fingers, Giselle said. And now, uncle, what did the Australian say? Was he angry with me for trespassing and stealing the guavas? There was a questioning look in her eyes as she stared at her uncle. He could see that the thought had filled her with worry, and in turn Giselle saw the expression in her uncle's eyes. They were flooding with the weariness that came toward the end of every day. Contritely, she whispered, Non, it does not matter. I will leave you now and come again in the morning. You can tell me then when you are less weary. She smoothed her uncle's pillow, preparing to leave, but he caught her hand. Her young face reminded him of many things, and he turned away to stare at the crucifix gleaming on the wall. When he spoke, Pierre whispered, You see in the Australian what I am not, don't you, my little one? He is straight and strong, unlike this twisted dwarf you have for an uncle. Giselle said quickly, Non, it is not true, my uncle. He is but someone who lives amongst us, a stranger. You are my uncle, the brother of my mother. As if that was a final seal on all that could be said, she lowered Pierre's hand and rested it on his chest before she kissed him. So, she added, do not ever say such things again. Pierre, my uncle, remember the things we have planned. Au revoir for now, and rest before Marie Therese brings you your supper. Her uncle said, yes. The box grows toward fullness, Giselle. Now that the Australian is buying my maize, it will fill more swiftly. Soon, perhaps, I can fly on my journey. Go with God, my sweet, and give my love to your mother. Tell her I am grateful she had such a daughter. Wearied beyond endurance, he suddenly sagged into a limp huddle and seemed to fall asleep. Creeping away from the bed, Giselle passed through the dusty rooms. From the kitchen attached to the rear of the wooden house came the clatter of a pot, then the rattle of a poker being jabbed into a stove fire. In the hushed evening quietness, the sounds had an echo of loneliness, as if they were part of the scheme her uncle dreamed and in which he alone could have faith. Going down the steps, Giselle wondered about Marie Therese. The sounds were made by her, yet, as almost always, she was not to be seen. Truly, Giselle thought, she is a one she's wonderful to poor Uncle Pierre. No one else would take the trouble. He is indeed a man completely helpless. The thought made her wonder, as she often did why it had had to happen, Pierre, her uncle, the pride of the village. She was glad when she reached the maize sheds and saw the three indigenes who worked for her uncle. Thankfully, she called Bonjour and heard their returned calls as she continued on past. Their guttural, slurred voices were somehow filled with the warmth of happy, healthy living, and she began to run, following the path homeward. Later, after a meal of fish, bread, and a small glass of wine and water, she went to her room. From the window she could see the mountain peaks, piled beautifully against a moonlit sky. From some of the peaks, where the nickel mines were, gleamed the brittle glare of electric lights. As she undressed, she imagined them as stars, 
scattered over the moon-drenched scrub. Then she wondered if her father, up there on one of the peaks, was thinking of her and her mother, or whether he was out hunting, searching through the scrub for deer. His brown, often dusty face came vividly to her as she knelt to say her prayers. He was a good man, she felt sure. There was a warm, sweaty smell about him when he came home that seemed to make the house complete. In the morning, Giselle awoke late. Downstairs, the kitchen was empty. After knocking on her mother's bedroom door, Giselle went inside and stopped by the bed. Her mother was sprawled, half sitting, half lying on the big goose feather pillows, holding her head in both hands. Oh, Giselle said softly, you have one of your headaches. I will bring you some coffee and aspirin. Her small brown hands moved quickly, straightening the pillows and urging her mother's hot, limp body on into its normal position between the sheets. Then Giselle hurried to light a fire in the stove and boil the water in the huge iron kettle. When the coffee was made, she set a filled cup on a tray with several pieces of bread broken from a loaf and added a bottle of aspirin she took from a shelf. There, Maman, she said after carrying the tray into the bedroom, now you will soon feel well. She spoke cheerfully, hoping to see her mother smile but her mother's sallow face remained apathetic. There was no comprehension in the eyes that were dulled by pain, and Giselle suddenly whispered, No, Maman, don't look like that. You look like Uncle Pierre. She shook two aspirin from the bottle and pushed them into her mother's hand. Her mother said, Why should I not look like him? Giselle, he is my brother. We are two of the same father and mother. She swallowed the aspirin one after the other between sips of coffee. Now go and have your breakfast. Afterward, take some bread and leave me alone all day. Tonight I shall be better. With a sigh, she sank down between the sheets again leaving the tray unbalanced. It almost slid to the floor before Giselle caught it. Knowing her mother's moods brought on by the periodic bouts of headache, Giselle crept from the room and ate her own breakfast in the kitchen. The bread was stale, but dipped in hot, sweet coffee, had a nutty flavor, especially the crust, which was thick from the old-fashioned method of baking used by Monsieur Darnell, the village baker. He used a stone oven heated first by a great crackling fire, then raked clean of all ashes. On baking days, the smell of steamy bread drifted across the village. As she rinsed the cups, Giselle heard the mission school bell ringing. Sound of it brought to her mind pictures of Father Hans, Sister Marlene, and the motley collection of black, brown, and white children. All would be gathering to file into one big classroom. After the Hail Marys, Father Hans would bless everyone, and Sister Marlene would stand, head bent near him, they were Germans dedicated to teach and work wherever their Catholic order sent them. Father Hans was a big, wild-eyed man with a flaming red beard. Sister Marlene was small and thin, barely as tall as some of the children. Both spoke French with guttural fluency. Putting some bread in a satchel, Giselle ran from the house as her bare feet lightly touched the warm red earth. She felt glad she was fourteen, glad she had left school, 
the surge of the sea and the quiet whispering hush of trees called to her strongly. She loved the feel of the wind flowing past her body, fluttering her dress and streaming out her hair. She loved, too, to see the world as a high arced sky rather than a narrow, stuffy classroom. Beyond this picture she could not see. Her life was lived in the village and on its neighboring sea-washed coast. No thought or dream could carry her beyond their scope, even Noame, some two hundred kilometers away, was a remote unreality. She had never seen its cobblestoned streets or the variety of its shop fronts. The earthen track she was following led through a wood of silvery saplings, where the wood ended merged into a tangle of riotous bougainvillea and lantana. The track branched several ways. Some branches led to other houses scattered around the village. One led to Uncle Pierre's, and one, the most used, led on to the village and ultimately to Madame Duval's store and its attendant café. For a moment, Giselle paused, undecided whether to call first and see her uncle, then follow her usual path from his house to the sea, or whether to continue on along the much-used track until she came to the village. A muffled voice from somewhere amongst the matted bushes in front of where she stood helped her to decide. Hello there, Giselle, it called. Are you going to the village? As the voice died away, its owner began to crash through the rasping bows toward the road. Presently, a boy of about the same age as Giselle stood beside her, brushing his clothes with his hands. His round, sallow face was topped by a thatch of brown, spiky hair, now covered in leaves and twigs, while he grinned self-consciously. Giselle said, Bonjour, Edouard Ruenda, is it better to crawl in the scrub than walk on the path as others do. She flicked the long yellow hair away from her eyes and stared at Edouard intently. Then she sensed her stare was making him even more embarrassed than he already was, and she turned and started to walk toward the village. Edouard said, I saw one of the rabbits Monsieur Vache lost from his hutch. It was black, black as a nun's silky gown. He almost ran to reach De Giselle's side and stride along with her. Giselle said, A nun's gown is not silk silky. It has a blackness that is drab. Suddenly, she wanted to run, to race along the path as fast as she could to get away from Edouard. She felt his ragged, untidy presence was spoiling the beauty of sunlight dappling the shadows through the leaves. But Edouard said, That is so, Giselle, so does a priest. Perhaps some day I will wear one. He picked up a stone and sent it hurtling far over the flower-covered bush tops. As the stone plopped down, rattling out of sight, Giselle said, Priest, do not throw stones, nor do they catch rabbits to take back to the butcher. The two walked in silence then until they reached the village. Edouard left to join some other boys, and Giselle continued on to Madame Duval's café. Two of the huge trucks outside she recognized as being from the nickel mine, where her father worked. She waited, 
hoping to see the drivers, and when they came out of the cafe, she hurried forward. One of them, a big swarthy man in blue denims, stopped to say hello, my sweet Giselle. You are out early, and his scarred dark face softened as he looked down. Giselle said, We, oui, monsieur, maman sent me away until her head is better. Is my father well? We have not had a letter for two weeks or more. She added the last sentence in explanation of her anxiety. The truck driver said, He is well, Giselle, never fear, but we are busy, you understand, at the mines. Like many of us, your father has little time to write. He bent for a moment, and his enormous hand cupped Giselle's before he strode on to his truck. The other driver was waiting, sitting impatiently in his truck. On the café veranda steps, Madame Duval came from the bar to watch the vehicles drive away. He is a fine man, she told Giselle, that Jacques Larue, they tell me he can shoot a deer at 400 meters. Giselle nodded. Always there was this talk of hunting deer. Yes, she said, watching the trucks swirl up dust as they left. He hunts with my father. Madame smiled. Your father, too. She agreed, turning to go inside, is a fine man. They work hard, these men, at the mines. Three ships are now at the wharf waiting for nickel. Au revoir, Giselle, unless, perhaps, you want something. She paused, hesitating in the doorway. Giselle said, No, thank you, madame. I am going to the sea, and, adding a hurried au revoir, ran across the wide, dusty road. Reaching <clears throat> the grassy edge that bordered it, she pushed through some scrub and came to a narrow path she knew. It was the familiar one she normally followed from her Uncle Pierre's to the sea. Feeling more free now that the clinging scrub was no longer pulling at her clothes, she began to run, soon from a grassy hillock. She had her first glimpse of the coast, and the white creaming crest on the reef and beyond of the vast reach of ocean, held still by the hushed translucent beauty of sea, sand, and sky, Giselle paused, motionless. She wished that the picture could stay, as if held forever in a window of her life's room. Then, suddenly, she began to run again, eager to reach the beach. Already her bare, dusty feet tingled for the feel of warm, restless water once the fine, powdery sand crunched underfoot. Giselle slowed to a tiptoeing walk. The empty loneliness of sea and sand lulled her as it always did. She was glad that few of the villagers ever bothered to go down to the sea at this particular stretch of coast. Mostly, they fished or swam to the southward rather than to the northward, where the great cattle company property reached for miles along the edge of the sea. Suddenly, remembering the manager, Giselle wondered again whether to walk where the sea lapped the beach could be trespassing. She wished she had asked Uncle Pierre. The land, she thought, must end somewhere. The paddock fences, which cut across beach and mangrove flats, are only to prevent cattle from
from straying when the tide is out. Wandering on, Giselle scrambled through one such fence, and after a long, weaving walk through the mangrove swamps, where she had recently caught five crabs, she came to another stretch of sand, then another fence, now far beyond any point she had ever reached before. Giselle looked around carefully. The shadows cast by the fence posts told her it was nearly noon, and the manager and his stockmen should be eating their midday meal, but it was better to be careful. One could never tell what might be happening on such a big property. She had seen the tracks of cattle and horses scarred on the wet salt flats between sand and swamps, yet she had seen neither the actual cattle nor the horses or their riders. The cattle hide from the sun, she told herself as she slipped between the barbed fence wires and the stockmen ride early, very early. Uncle Pierre has said that they ride while the sky is still dark to catch the cattle in the open. Thought of Uncle Pierre made her contrite. I must see him tonight, she added, and felt for a crust of bread in the satchel. I will tell him of all this and of the sun sparkling on the sea. Then, as another thought came to her, who knows but the manager and his men might be far, far away on the other side of the property, far up in the mountains, perhaps. Freed of further worry, she munched the dry bread contentedly. When the satchel was empty, she sighed, wishing for just one more crust. There was a hollowness still within her that she decided to fill with guavas. She found a clump of yellow fruited trees and wandered along again, eating the ripe pink insides of the fruit she picked. The pips crushed easily between her strong white teeth, though the thick yellow skin made her lips sore. She was splashing in the sea and rinsing her mouth with the salty water when she decided to look for crabs. Some for Uncle Pierre, she said and some from Amon. Today I will divide them so that each has some. Eager to begin, she ran from the water to strip bark for string and to break off a forked stick for holding or turning the crabs over. Then, for the first time, she saw cattle. They were grazing or standing, swishing their tails under a clump of trees some three hundred meters away. Even from that distance, Giselle could tell they were big, wide-horned bullocks, sleek where the sun made a dappled glint on their hides. So Giselle whispered, staying crouched at the foot of a tree for a moment, I am where Monsieur fattens his prime beef for Numay. I must be careful not to disturb them, but before long, absorbed with chasing scuttling crabs through the shallow water, she forgot time, cattle, and the possibility of seeing the Australian manager or one of his stockmen. Three safely bound crabs were in her satchel when she stopped to watch a huge shark swimming some distance from her. Its high dorsal fin and smaller weaving tail fin made her shudder in the sun glare. She could imagine the huge blunt head and cruel jaws questing underwater, feel the sudden frightening swirl of water around her, and the harsh grating rasp of the brute's rough skin on her own. Oh, she said, suddenly straightening, I am glad the water is too shallow for it to come any nearer. Then, as she turned to face toward the shore, 
Her eyes widened in astonishment, as if mesmerized by the sight of one lonely young girl in a fluttering dress. The cattle she had seen earlier were converging into a jostling, menacing mob that was silent with danger. Even the hoofs crushing the soft, loamy ground made no sound. For a terrified moment, Giselle wanted to run, yet her quick, searching glance told her there was nowhere to run to. All around was the quiet, shallow water. Out to sea, if she swam, was the huge, waiting shark. On the shore, now close to the water's edge, were the silent, plodding cattle. In their lead, Giselle saw a great red beast shake its glittering horns. Mesmerized, she stared back at the approaching bullocks and felt her strength drain away. Her arms and legs seemed to go numb as the cattle began to moan. First it was a low-pitched whimpering, then suddenly every cud-filled throat bawled with wanton anger. Horns rattled against horns as the big beast excited each other. Then, as if from nowhere, a car bounced and swerved along the beach, coming from behind some lantana. In a sudden jerking stop, it slithered near the bullocks, and the driver leaped out to run, splashing into the water. His feet scattered spray that sparkled in the sun as he pounded toward Giselle. For fleeting seconds, the leading cattle paused, puzzled by the new arrival, but pushed on by those behind. They began to slosh forward into the water as the man splashed nearer to, Gis to Giselle. He shouted, Lie down, mademoiselle, and keep close behind me. No matter what happens, stay flat in the water. He pulled his hat lower to jam it tightly on his head. His lean brown face was expressionless, though Giselle could sense he was angry. She shifted the crabs from under her stomach before she said out loud, Oui, monsieur, I am flat, as you say. Would it not be better if I stood so we could run if the cattle come near? The Australian manager braced, watching the cattle start to trot. From a trot, the whole fierce, bawling mob broke into a spray-soaked gallop. The Australian shouted, no, it is your dress that is strange to them. My being on foot also, they are only used to men on horseback. He wondered, as he shouted, whether to stand rock still and hope that the herd would cleave apart each side of him, or whether to shout and jump at the last minute and frighten the cattle into confusion. Either way, he knew, could be tricky. One bold bullock might deliberately horn what it thought was a jumping, fighting antagonist. Others might decide to crush in on what would look like little more than a motionless tree stump. Then, suddenly, the first great splattering bullocks were in front of him, and he had to make a decision. With a wild, screaming yell, he jumped high and slapped his hands over his head, time after time, until he lost count. He slapped and yelled while the bullocks surged and bellowed around him, dazed by the scrunching, pounding roar that washed over her. Giselle almost buried herself in the churned, swirling water, a forest of thick, stamping legs topped by massive straining bodies, seemed to darken the sky that had once been so bright and smiling. She closed her eyes to shut out the terrible, frightening sight. When at last she opened them, 
She was being drawn up to her feet by the Australian manager. She saw that the bullocks were gone, galloping in a wild, tail-swishing herd. Back toward the beach, and somewhere she knew the shark was also gone, driven away by the noise and confusion, scuffling the long, wet hair from her face. She whispered, Oh, it was terrible, monsieur, terrible. I thought you would be killed. The Australian manager said, I thought so too. Next time you want to trespass, choose somewhere else. Did I not warn you and your uncle that cattle are dangerous, if annoyed by something strange? And a young girl, he added, striding in the direction of his car, dressed as you are, is very strange indeed. The bullocks are used only to stockmen mounted on horses. He gestured impatiently and glanced back to see if Giselle was listening. But the sea, monsieur, I was in the sea. Surely no man can own the sea. The manager took off his boots to empty the water from them, pulling their soggy leather on again. He told Giselle that the company's land limits extend to all four shores, and where they end, he added, is anybody's guess. So, Giselle said, nobody knows. The sea comes and goes, so how can there be an end when there is no end and the sea is never still? She spoke quickly, hoping the Australian understood. His knowledge of French was good, she knew, but like most foreigners, he spoke the language slowly and liked to be spoken to equally slowly. He said, you question too much, but there was a lightness in his voice that made Giselle happy. Looking inside her satchel to make sure the crabs were safe, she hesitated, wondering what else to say. To her and to most of the villagers, the manager had always appeared to be a remote person, someone aloof, both as a foreigner and as a man who held a responsible position. Now that the wild excitement was over and she was standing near him, dripping water as he was, she felt suddenly shy. It was her fault his good clothing was sodden and probably ruined by sea water, and she wondered where she had found the courage to argue with him about the boundaries of the big property he managed. Oh, she whispered, I have said too much. Please forgive me, and I have not thanked you for saving my life. Merci, monsieur. I am indeed grateful. She half bowed, but the satchel slipped, and she had to grab quickly to stop the crabs from falling. The manager said, Okay, but remember the warning. Now I will take you as far as Terari. I have to see some of my men there. Feeling more contrite than ever, Giselle shook her head. No, monsieur, she said. I will walk by the sea. My wet dress would spoil your car. Perhaps, too, I shall catch more crabs. She held up the three already caught to implement the tone of her voice. The manager nodded, climbing into his car. Behind the wheel, he said, Au revoir, mademoiselle. Be careful to reach home soon. The sun sets quickly once it tips the mountains. Giselle called, Au revoir, monsieur, and thank you again for your kindness. The manager waved, then the car rolled away, bumping over the uneven surface. Giselle watched until it was gone disappearing in a clump of yellow-flowered cassis. Then she turned to walk slowly homeward. There was a loneliness in the lap of the sea that seemed more pronounced now, and she barely saw the crabs that scuttled away to safety. Her thoughts were of the manager and the roaring, bawling cattle. Now that the actual shock was over, she could see more clearly what might have happened. Her dress crinkled wetly as she shuddered.